Text Talks. Hello, everyone. This is Brian Black at Lancaster University. And today's text talk mini lecture is on moksha. As with other mini lectures, you'll remember that there's a slideshow that goes with this. And so if you look at your second slide, you'll see that I've put a lot of questions, questions about the meaning of life, questions that various religious traditions around the world often ask and try to answer. Is there a creator or a higher being? What is the foundation of life? What happens to us when we die? Can we achieve ultimate bliss or perfection? What is real? Is there a higher realm? And in today's lecture about moksha, even though at the end of the lecture I'll be spending my time mostly talking about moksha itself, I think that we should see that moksha is related to um, these sorts of questions. Now, if we look at the next slide, um, we can see that the Mahabharata, um, which is the text that we've been looking at um, a lot throughout these text talk lectures, that the Mahabharata offers a number of different teachings about what happens to people after they die. Um, and again, one of the reasons why we use the Mahabharata in these lectures is because the variety of different ways that the Mahabharata talks about um, different teachings, about what happens to us after we die, about different ways of living one's life, that the variety that we see in the Mahabharata is a good representation of the variety that we see in Hinduism more generally. And within the Mahabharata, we see that there are a number of different perspectives on what happens to people after they die. Now, in a previous text talk lecture, we talked about karma, and certainly um, the idea that people are, um, that all living beings are caught up in this interconnected web of karma and rebirth is something that we see um, not only in a lot of Hindu um, sources, but also in Buddhist and Jain sources as well. So the teaching of karma and rebirth is widespread within Hinduism and certainly something that we see in this particular text, the Mahabharata. But one of the things I want to bring attention to today is that um, Hindus also have other ideas of what happens when people die. And that sometimes these ideas are um, linked with ideas regarding karma and rebirth. And sometimes they're just different opinions. Sometimes um, they're presented as alternative or contrasting views. Um, I think one of the things that we really need to remember is that in a religious tradition as diverse as Hinduism, we would, not, we would not expect or we should not expect all Hindus over time to agree on such a complex and foundational question as what happens to people after they die. Um, and so within Hinduism as well as within the Mahabharata itself, we see different accounts, different ideas. And so some of the other ideas include going to heaven. Now, of course, the Hindu heaven is not exactly the same as a Christian heaven. Um, so I've put in the slide the, the term svarga, um, which is the Hindu term for heaven. Um, and so I think it's important to try to... Um, you know, to let the, the text speak for themselves in terms of how they describe this heavenly realm and not to think of it in terms of a Christian heaven. But at the same time, it is a realm that people can go to, sometimes retaining their own body and dwell in after they live on earth. 
Um, so it is seen as sort of an afterlife, an afterlife that takes place in a different realm, in an afterlife where um, people live alongside um, demigods um, from the distant past. Another, um, another view on what happens when people die um, is that people are somehow um, become one with the divine. Now, the divine can be seen in terms of, of um, Brahman um, from the Upanishads, um, this idea of some eternal life principle, or it could also um, be seen in terms of a specific god or goddess, you know, such as Krishna. Um, and then, as we'll see, another um, another view on what happens um, is that people can achieve moksha. Now, one of the things we'll see in some of the examples that we'll be looking at is that sometimes moksha is more depicted in terms of some sort of state of bliss or awareness that one achieves while they're still alive um, and then continues, you know, people continue to be in that state then after they die. Um, and on this slide, the, the third slide, I've also listed a number of teachings related to ideas about life after death, because I think that we should see that when um, these, these sources talk about dharma or yoga or the four ashramas or renunciation or meditation or ahimsa or bhakti, that um, that often these teachings about how one should live one's life while they're alive um, are directly related to ideas of um, what will happen to them after they die. Okay, so as I said, we talked about karma and rebirth in a previous text talk lecture. So now I want to look at some of these other, um, these other ideas of what happens um, after we die. And I want to start with this notion of heaven, Svarga. Um, and as I said, um, you know, Svarga should not be seen um, as an equivalent to a Christian heaven. Um, however, I think it's important to mention Svarga because I think that sometimes um, people who aren't Hindu have this idea that, that all Hindus believe in karma and rebirth, or all Hindus believe in moksha. And um, I think that sometimes people are a bit surprised to see that there is some notion of a he heavenly realm that exists um, throughout a number of sources in the Hindu tradition. We see this as far back as the Rig Veda, we see this in the Upanishads, and here we see it in the Mahabharata. So if we're looking at slide number four, um, here's a depiction, here, here's a picture from the manuscript that I introduced in our previous lecture about the Mahabharata itself, of all the heroes um, ascending towards heaven at the very end of the Mahabharata. So, in other words, the main heroes of the Mahabharata all go to this heavenly realm at the end of their lives. And in the Mahabharata, this heavenly realm is closely associated with being a reward for great warriors, people who die in battle. And this heavenly realm not only awaits uh, the Pandavas, the heroes of the story, but also the Kauravas um, achieve the heavenly realm, or at least at least some passages indicate that they do, even though others indicate that they don't. But the idea here is that um, that if you go out and you 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 die for your cause, that you will be rewarded with a place in the heavenly realm. Um, and here we have, at the very end of the Mahabharata, this quotation where, um, where King Yudhishthira, when he finally ascends to heaven, he meets the god Indra in heaven. And Indra tells him, dwell here, Lord of Kings, 
in the realm won by your own good deeds. So interestingly here, we see that karma isn't related to rebirth, it's related to achieving a place in the heavenly realm. Why do you still burden yourself with human affection? You have attained the highest perfection as no other man has ever done. Now he's not saying that no other man has reached the heavenly realm, but he is saying that he's sort of, um, that, that he's been more perfect in his life um, than, than other people. He says, yet still human emotion touches you, Lord of men. This is heaven. Behold here the divine seers and sitas for whom the highest heaven is home. So here we see that Yudhishthira ascends to heaven. He still retains his own body and he is sharing this realm with um, Vedic gods like Indra, as well as the divine seers of old. Now, if we look at the next slide, we can see yet another depiction of what happens to people when they die. Here I have a, um, a selection from the Bhagavad Gita. And you might remember that the Bhagavad Gita is part of the Mahabharata, and at one point, during the conversation between Arjuna and Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna asks, how and what is the highest sacrifice in this body? And how, at the time of departure, or the time of death, are you known by those whose selves are restrained? Um, and Krishna's answer to this, you know, so basically, you know, one way of interpreting Arjuna's question is, what happens to us when we die? And Krishna says, and at the end of time, remembering me, freed from the body, the one who departs goes to my state of being. There is no doubt in this matter, whatever state of being one remembers when, at the end, one abandons the body, one goes to that state, always changed into that state of being, O oh, son of Kunti. Um, and so here, interestingly, Krishna is putting forth this idea that whatever state of mind one is in during the actual moment that one is dying, that that's the state that one achieves after death. I think this is a this is a very interesting way of looking at um, at the afterlife and or what happens uh, when one dies. It's um, you know this is a fairly widespread view within Hinduism, but perhaps not as widespread as some of the other views that we're looking at. Um, anyway, this is one of Krishna's answers to the question of what happens after life. Okay. Now, if we look at our next slide, I want to go to what this lecture is mainly about, and that is this idea of moksha. Now, moksha is a, you know, a very difficult concept to, to grasp, and I think one of the reasons why it is difficult is, again, because um, different teachers, different texts within Hinduism describe it somewhat differently. And again, rather than being overly confused by this, I think that we should, you know, expect that when it comes to something as unknown, as uncertain, as difficult to describe and comprehend um, as what happens after life, um, we wouldn't expect all Hindus, all texts, even all passages within the same text to agree with each other. So, I think it's important to see that moksha is actually described in a number of different ways related to each other, but, you know, we might say that some of these ways contrast with each other as well. So, for example, probably the most well-known and most repeated way of understanding moksha is as an ultimate release or ultimate peace, ultimate freedom from the karmic chain of existence.
So moksha is often seen as the direct opposite of samsara. So whereas samsara is this um, endless round of, of birth and rebirth, moksha is the escape, is the freedom, is the release from this um, cycle of karma. Moksha is sometimes described as an unconditioned state, as a transcendent state. Um, but then sometimes it is true that, that moksha can be described more in terms of a heavenly realm. Although most of the philosophers within the Hindu tradition wouldn't quite describe it in that way. Now here I have a quotation from a teacher by the name of Pancha Shika who teaches the King Janaka um, in the 12th book of the Mahabharata. And here Panchashika is describing moksha. He says, the vigilant person who masters this understanding of liberation and seeks this self is not tainted by the unpleasant results of karma. Just like a lotus leaf is not made wet by water, he is released from the innumerable bonds that shackle him firmly, including those caused by his offspring and those that come about by chance. When he abandons pleasure and pain, he attains liberation. He leaves this body and attains the highest destiny. So in a passage like this, I think that we, um, moksha isn't defined but it's described in a number of different ways, all of which can help us get a better understanding of a sort of Hindu characterization of moksha. One of the metaphors here is comparing the enlightened person, the one who has achieved moksha, to a lotus leaf that is not made wet by water. So in other words, here, um, Panchashika is talking about somebody who's achieved moksha within this lifetime, somebody who's still alive, who's still interacting with people in the world. But just like a lotus leaf doesn't get wet, the person who's achieved moksha doesn't have karma stick to him or her. Um, this person is released from the innumerable bonds that shackle him. Um, interesting, including those caused by his offspring. Um, now, here we see something very interesting. First of all, we see that, um, that Panchashika envisions that people who have children can achieve moksha. Um, that, um, that to achieve moksha, one does not necessarily have had to live one's entire life as a renunciate. Um, now, it's interesting to think here that he, that Panchashika is talking to a king, King Janaka, when he's saying this. Um, so perhaps it's not surprising that he's sort of, by describing moksha in this way, he's leaving room for Janaka to be able to claim to have achieved moksha. But he's also warning that one should not become attached to one's children. And so on the one hand, from a sort of um, more mainstream Dharma point of view, especially if we think of Krishna's teaching of karma yoga, for example, this might seem a bit harsh to not be attached to one's offspring, to almost, you know, you know, to try to separate oneself from them. But this is the ultimate test of somebody who, um, who wants to achieve moksha. Okay, so here we can see, uh, now I want to look at some other examples. So if we go to slide number seven, we see another dialogue with King Janaka. This one, he's talking to his old friend, Yagnavalkya. Um, all the examples that I'm using here are dialogues with King Janaka from the 12th book of the Mahabharata. Um, so it's interesting how Janaka is often the sort of dialogue partner 
of sages who talk about moksha, um, but as we'll see, these dialogues go in different ways. Here we see Janaka and Yagnivalkya together again. Um, you might remember that these guys were friends from the Upanishads. So hundreds of years later, in a different text, we also find a dialogue between Janaka and Yagnivalkya. Um, and this is their one and only discussion in the Mahabharata. Now, in the Upanishads, it's interesting to remember that their discussion is about renunciation. Um, in the Mahabharata, Janaka is, uh, Yagnivalkya, sorry, is teaching Janaka about Samkhya and yoga. Um, at the end of this dialogue, Janaka gains knowledge of moksha. He installs his son as king and then becomes a renouncer. So, first of all, it's interesting that the king, Janaka, um, is depicted as achieving moksha, um, but only after he gives up his kingdom. Um, and um, one of the things that um, Yagnivalkya says to Janaka along the way, he says, indeed, the man who is blessed with knowledge of the soul, or that um, we, we should think of Atman here, knowledge of the self. O monarch, practices the course of life recommended by the philosophers and conquers death by uniting his soul with the supreme soul. At last he attains to what is entirely indestructible, which is without birth, which is auspicious and immutable and eternal and stable, and which is incapable of being attained by men of unclean souls. So here, Yagnivalkya depicts moksha as uniting the one's individual Atman with the supreme Atman. Or another way of thinking about it is of uniting one's Atman with Brahman. Now, it's interesting that this is a teaching that's very Upanishadic, so it's not surprising to see that these characters from the Upanishads basically reappear in the Mahabharata to, to offer this teaching. But it's also interesting that in the Upanishads themselves, especially the, the older Upanishads where Janaka and Yagyavalkya appear, we don't really find much about moksha. So, in other words, here we see in the Mahabharata, these figures from the Upanishads are sort of reinterpreting old Upanishadic doctrines, especially the union of Atman and Brahman, in terms of what might be considered a slightly newer teaching, this teaching of moksha. Okay. Let's look at our next slide, slide number eight. And here we have another dialogue with Janaka. Here, this famous dialogue between Janaka and the female renunciate, Sulaba. Um, I believe that I've mentioned Sulaba in other text talk lectures. Here we see her again in this context because one of the things they talk about here is moksha. At the very beginning of this dialogue, we learn that Sulaba is a female wandering mendicant who has attained moksha. And she hears that King Janaka has, has achieved moksha without renouncing his position as king. Now, one of the things that's interesting here is that King Janaka is actually depicted differently in this dialogue from the two others that we've already mentioned. Whereas in the others, he achieves moksha after he renounces his kingship and is depicted in a relatively good light. Here, he's depicted more negatively um, as boasting about having achieved moksha before he renounced. And um, because of this, Sulaba goes to question him. Um, so one of the sort of messages of this 
dialogue is that one cannot achieve moksha while still um, maintaining one's duties and responsibilities within the world. That the only way to achieve moksha is to renounce. Now, um, as I've talked about before, um, this is a wonderful dialogue in terms of um, sort of depicting Sulabha's yogic powers, um, and she uses her yogic powers to enter into Janaka's body, and she argues with him um, while they're inhabiting the same body. Um, what, but back to our topic of moksha, one of the things that's interesting here is, um, again, um, they're talking about moksha more as something that's achievable within this lifetime. And Sulabha is arguing that if Janaka were enlightened, he would see no differences between himself and her. So in other words, she's arguing that the achievement of moksha basically um, you know, necessarily um, triggers a different sort of perspective. And so from the perspective of somebody who has achieved moksha, there's no gender differences between people, there's no caste differences between people, that you would realize that from an enlightened perspective, um, we are all Atman, and therefore um, we are all basically ultimately the same. And here she famously says, since you see yourself within yourself by means of yourself, why do you not in exactly the same way by means of yourself see yourself in someone else? O Lord of the earth, what indication is there that one is freed? In other words, that one has achieved moksha when he treats some as an enemy, others as allies, others as neutrals in victory, in alliances, and in war. So in other words, the sign of somebody who's achieved moksha is that they will treat everybody the same. What indication is there that one is freed or has achieved moksha when he does not see sameness in kindness and unkindness, in weakness and in strength? And so not only do we learn from this dialogue that um, moksha is a different um, perspective in terms of how one relates to and understands other people, but we're also reminded that, um, that anybody can achieve moksha, um, that, that achieving moksha um, is not something that is only available to men, but is available to women as well. Okay, one more dialogue to look at, and that is, um, again, another one featuring Janaka, and this is with the young Brahmin Shuka. Now, Shuka is the son of Vyasa, um, and for those of you who have really been paying attention to the Mahabharata, you might remember that Vyasa is the author of the story who also appears in his own story. So even though Shuka doesn't appear very often in the Mahabharata, he is an important character because he is the son of the author himself. Um, he's also one of the very few characters in the Mahabharata said to have achieved moksha. So as we've seen in the previous dialogue, we know that Sulabha has achieved moksha. Um, and here we see that Shuka appear, um, has achieved moksha. But actually, they are two of um, very few characters who, um, who achieved moksha in the Mahabharata. So in this dialogue... Shuka asks his father to teach him about enlightenment. But rather than teaching his son himself, his dad, Vyasa, instructs him to seek out Janaka. Um, so it's interesting that here, Shuka is going to learn about moksha from King Janaka. So while in the previous dialogue we saw Janaka was depicted in a rather negative light, 
Here he's depicted more positively again. Now, Janaka teaches him about the four stages of life, the four ashramas. Um, and he also teaches them about the universality of the self. At the end of the dialogue, Janaka pronounces Shuka as already enlightened, explaining that Shuka knows more than he realizes. So it's interesting. Shuka comes to Janaka asking, you know, please teach me about moksha. How do I achieve it? At the end, Janaka's like, you've already achieved it. You're already there. So it's interesting that we have a dialogue where somebody has achieved moksha and doesn't know it yet. Anyway, one of the questions that Shuka asked Janaka along the way, I think is, is quite revealing, especially because it, it overlaps with our understanding of another doctrine in Hinduism, the doctrine of the four stages of life, the four ashramas. Shuka says, if one succeeds in attaining an understanding cleansed by study of the scriptures and to true conceptions of all things, is it still necessary for such a person to adopt one after the other the three stages of life? Janaka says, the man who through penances performed over the course of many births succeeds in obtaining a cleansed mind and understanding of soul certainly attains moksha in even the first stage of life. So, in other words, Shuk is asking, does one need to go through all four stages of life before one attains moksha? And Janaka's answer is no. That basically some people can achieve moksha in the first stage of life, especially given the fact that this is only you know, their lifetime in this life is only, you know, one in countless births and rebirths. So he sort of suggested, suggesting that one has already put in their time following these four stages of life in previous lives, and so therefore doesn't need to go through all four in this lifetime. Okay. Now, I want to, um, to briefly return to the first dialogue we looked at when Panchashika was teaching Janaka. Remember, Panchashika, sorry, Panchashika was um, offered um, Janaka that memorable metaphor of comparing achieving moksha um, to um, a lotus leaf that doesn't get wet. And one of the wonderful things about this dialogue is that Panchasika gives a number of different metaphors, all of which um, can help us understand how Hindus, especially in the ancient world, visualized um, or tried to understand what moksha actually um, um, you know, consisted of. So here he says, a spider circumambulating its web is made to fall, but still survives when the threads are destroyed. In just the same way, when a liberated person abandons misery, like a clod of earth crushed by a pounding stone. Um, another example, he says, just as an antelope abandons its old horns, or a snake goes off without a care in the world, once it has shed its, sl its slough, so too does the liberated person abandon misery. A bird relinquishes a tree falling into the water and flied off since it is freed of burdens. The person who abandons pleasure and pain is liberated in the same way. When he abandons the body, he attains the highest destiny. Um, and then it says at the end, when King Janaka saw that his city had been burned, he said, nothing whatsoever of mine has been burned here. Okay, now I wanted to read those out because these are such vivid descriptions of moksha, um, but I'm not going to talk you through these quotations because I think that these are quotations that are really worth returning to again and again as you try to understand moksha um, and 
also if there is a question on your exam about moksha um, it might you know you might consider using one of these quotations in your answer um, when you need to give some sort of textual evidence so in the, the next slide the the final slide um, number 11 I have a number of discussion questions and um, basically what I want you to do here is to go back at not only the previous slide, the quotations I didn't talk you through, but also the quotations on each one of the slides um, where we saw a dialogue between Janaka and a different sage, and look at the variety of ways that moksha is described. And I want you to try to look for some of the similarities and what are some of the differences. Um, pay particular attention to different metaphors, as well as not just what the metaphor is, but how that metaphor works, what that metaphor is really describing, what the implications are then um, for what that metaphor tells us about moksha. Um, one of the things you might think about is to what extent do these different dialogues portray um, moksha differently um, and to what extent do they um, portray moksha similarly. Another thing that you might think about while you're um, reflecting on moksha itself is also how these dialogues portray Janaka differently and what that might say about different ideas um, related to moksha. Um, so this was our final sort of um, uh, slide of content, and then I do have one more slide, and um, again listing a bunch of translations and partial translations of the Mahabharata. I really um, encourage you to look up some of these very passages yourself and to see the quotations that um, that, that I have highlighted within their wider context. Okay, well, thank you very much. That's all for today, and I look forward to our next Text Talk lecture. Thank you.